me number one. For some nations, nighttime comes, the evening sets, and they fade into history. But for other nations, morning comes again. And today we're going to be talking about a nation who's had probably more mornings than any other nation. It is now known as the land of the rising sun. Welcome to Japan. Roll the intro. <laughs> You know, that actually may have been one of my better intros to date. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. But good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Geopolitics of Tiberius D. Today we're going to be talking about the geopolitical history of Japan. You guys know how this works. Last episode, we talked about the country spotlight, where Japan is today. It's a little rough, but could be a lot better. But here's the thing about Japanese history, is that in a nutshell... The land of the rising sun is an apt description because while the sun sets on the Japanese empire from time to time, it tends to come back. It tends to reinvent itself and return from history, unlike a many other powers that simply fade away. So, getting into this in a nutshell is that this is a lot of Japanese history, and I can go back uh, for eons. But to put this in the modern geopolitical history, we're going to surmise most of Japanese history, and I apologize for this, as a general cycle that what we kind of see with China, which is things rise, they fall, they come back. And we can talk about the Ashikage Shogunate or the Tokugawa Shogunate, is that largely Japan has its time where it is united, it is strong, it is powerful, but then eventually it breaks apart and, er, and shatters and disintegrates and has to rebuild itself. Very much akin to Chinese history in some regards here, but again, we're going to skip over most of that. Our story today picks up largely with the end of the Tokugawa Shogunate. And largely what, it, what, what is going on here is that the Tokugawa have been running for the better part of, excuse me, the better part of 200 years and doing decently well at it. Um, they, you know, the, it's getting to that bloated, corrupt level, but it's not so bad that it's absolutely horrible. But there's a problem. Uh, 1849, if I remember the correct year, is that you have the Opium Wars start over in China. And this absolutely shocks the Japanese and most of the Asian world, as everyone knows who China is on this side of the planet. And uh, to hear that China has been absolutely defeated by uh, these, these other peoples from the lands of the outside in glorious pitch battle, to the degree that they are subjugated, the great Chinese empire, the, the center of the world is subjugated, uh, unto their wishes is absolutely a monumental thing that happens within um, that what happens within East Asia, and of course this this war will last a couple years. But come 1852, 1853, people are getting the message: the Europeans are here, and it's not going well for for Asia. At the same time, a man named Commodore Matthew Perry will roll in with four cruisers into Tokyo Bay. And we'll largely say, you know, it's about time you guys open up trade. I'll be back in about a year. And uh, if you haven't done so, you will be compelled at gunpoint to do so. And so Japan basically walks into history here going or at the throat of a gun. Or sorry, at, at having a gun to their throat. Pardon my language here. Um, openly being told to join the modern world. Or get wrecked just as China had. And for all of the bad things that are about to happen, China or Japan is largely going to start doing that. And so today, or at least, excuse me, at this point, we get into what we now know as the, to, or excuse me, the uh, Meiji Restoration, which is largely what this will happen. And uh, there's a lot of pol politics that I have to skim over here. Part one, because I don't know every specific detail, because it's it's internal Japanese politics, but also internal Japanese history, which, while I know some, I do not know all of it. So forgive me for a level of not being an expert here. But also, on the other hand, is that uh, it's a bunch of names I can't pronounce and a bunch of... Uh, 
uh, correlations that I have yet to really continually map in my head. But here's the general gist. What happens is that Japan and factions within Japan realize that Japan has to reform. Things have to change or Japan is going to get left to hunt behind uh, to these neo-imperial rivals that can absolutely snuff them out in, in not too long at all. If Japan, I'm sorry, if China can be defeated by one of these imperial powers, what does that say for Japan? Japan would absolutely get wrecked. And so those that are pragmatic, those that are a little bit more visionary, and basically, if you would call it, uh, I wouldn't call it liberal, but those who are not the conservatives that want to hang on to tradition largely realize that a new age must come for Japan. And so a reform starts. Uh, the problem is, is that the country basically goes into the midst of civil war. Uh, it largely starts with social strife and social breakdown. And the Tokugawa Shogunate is incredibly, is getting um, pulled apart uh, at the seams because everything that is going on is fundamentally tearing at the structures that you have within this uh, within the society. It is largely a, not necessarily a caste-based society, but it gets into that to some degree. But it's very much a um, hierarchical state, uh, largely with, uh, you You have um, basically the working class as normal. You have artisans and the merchants, and then you get into the nobility. And the nobility are weird because they're the samurai. They're, they're basically these warrior castes that had, over the terms of the Tokugawa Shogunate, become the administrative class is that they were trained professional warriors and they were quite good at it but with very few enemies to fight both at broad or I'm sorry within home and abroad they've largely become the aristocracy of the um, of the Japanese home islands and of the Tokugawa shogunate and so the problem here is that while some will um, take to this change in a, in a, in a great way Others will not. Others will fight for tradition and purpose and meaning. And some of it will be interesting because for a time it might go away or it might be diminished. But Japan will bring some of this back in big, it, I'm sorry, in a large margin. And we'll talk about this with particularly Bushido getting into this. But rolling back is that you have the year I vote Commodore Matthew Perry. He shows up and scares the living hell out of Japan. And uh, says he'll be back in a year. Well, he comes back in about nine months. Doesn't even make it that long. And, and not only does he come back with cruisers, but he comes back with the more. I believe he almost doubles his force. It's either seven or eight when he comes back. And basically negotiates the first round of a trade deal between the United States and what is effectively the Tokugawa Shogunate. The thing that's going on here at this time is that you're going to have Japan openly at the point where they could be conquered. They could have people subjugate their will and you'll have the Europeans basically have trade cities within Japan and everything that we have seen in China. But Japan does this a little differently. Say what you will about the, the social strife going on is that whoever is making the deals here largely makes deals that actually benefit Japan in some regard. Now, of course, that they have to open up their doors to uh, a lot of people that they find unsavory and that uh, are going to politically will them in certain directions. But <clears throat> for what the Chiba or excuse me, for what the Japanese do here is that they are able to mitigate this in a particular way that that allows Japan to actually make the imperial powers of Britain and France and Holland and the Americans largely vie, vie for power within, and they never give one of them too much. And it largely leads to an in, or excuse me, it largely leads to an end all conversation, to where those who are in a threat of conquering Japan or getting too much influence, the Japanese will openly seek the assistance of those who are not, in in a attempt to balance power. And so the Japanese will make trade deals with the Russians. They'll make trade deals with the Chinese. They'll make trade deals with the Dutch. The French, I'm thinking the Spanish at some point too here, uh, the Portuguese as well, and the British. And so they'll basically be able to deploy one European power after another, and so that if anyone wants to force the issue on Japan, everybody else is going to jump in, and you've got it yourself a world war. Not too bad of a plan, and it works. 
Now, the other thing, though, is that within Japan itself, you can imagine all of this change where a nation had largely said for the better part of 200 years that they are not going to open themselves up to the world. And in fact, they're openly going to close it and kill anybody who shows up that is remotely not Japanese. This doesn't work out too well. And so Japan basically starts breaking it down into social strife where you have reformist factions and moderate factions and conservative factions that are trying to uh, basically vie for power in the direction of what Japan is going to go. The long and the short here is that there is a jostling. Sometimes the conservatives were actually winning. Sometimes the moderates were winning. And sometimes the more reformists were winning. Eventually what happens here is something quite weird. The Tokugawa shogunate gets become, gets become so weak that it no longer controls Japan. And Japan breaks out in a civil war. I've alluded to this. But the person who actively starts heading a lot of what is going on within Japan is, ironically enough, the emperor. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, instead of China, where the emperor is largely killed and you take his place, Japan always has the figurehead, the shogunate, that is the active ruler of Japan. And they sidestep the emperor, and the emperor is the figurehead. Excuse me. And uh, largely what you have here... So the shogunate basically rules rules in the name of the emperor. Well, largely what you'll see with the emperor, and particularly with the rise of Emperor Meiji, is that he doesn't quite like what is being done in this stead. He is smart, educated, very capable ruler. And what largely comes about is that he gets into politics. And with your name being the Emperor of Japan, is that even though it has been incredibly unceremonial and contradictory at this point, for a Japanese ruler, or particularly the Japanese emperor, to be involved in the affairs of state, he feels that he has to, that he must, and he does. And he largely is able to put together a political coalition that will eventually help him out. And now, of course, at first when he starts here, he's largely at the behest of other people. That he is buying into power with certain people uh, that are largely using him as a backstop. So... Hey, the Emperor's on my side. I'm going to be ruling in the name of the Emperor. I'm going to be the next Shogun, but Emperor's on my side. Now, <clears throat> I'm glossing over a lot of history here, and I apologize for that because that's a lot of details that I don't want to have misconstrued. But in a general nutshell, what we're actually looking at here is two things. One, the three major factions of the Reformists, the Moderates, and the... Uh, the conservatives will eventually vie at each other to a point where they'll all keep, keep each other largely whittled down uh, or almost exhausted, and eventually one or two of them will eventually start getting the top. Um, there's a big conversation on what happens between that because in a lot of regards, the moderate faction is the one that kind of comes out. Um, but there's a conversation on if the reformists became moderates or the conservatives became moderates because there's a lot of flip-flopping, a political jostling here where... At one point, this dude's in charge and he's doing great, and then there's another dude who's in charge that's doing great. Uh, you have a lot of people that are ro largely rotating in the, the general political power dynamic here. And it's largely what we see in areas of political or of social strife, is that it's basically political king of the hill, and while somebody gets to become political king, or you know political hegemon for a quick second, it seldomly ever lasts in the era, era of instability. And ironically enough, it is actually Meiji that is able to corner people out in a particular direction that while there is a lot of blood spilled and it's not a blood, you know, it's quite a nasty series of uh, revolutions and civil wars is that over the period of about, um, excuse me, over the period of about 20 years, everyone is eventually weaseled out to where the moderates have largely won and Meiji is more or less at the head of it. Um, now, granted, there is some give and take here about who all is in charge at the end, but that's not really what we need to focus on here. Uh, number one, because I can't tell you, but number two is that it's not really that important because Japan is going to exit the Meiji Restoration, and we're getting into about the 1870s here in a completely different mindset. They are going to balance the new way, the new way and the new era with old traditions and they're going to meld it all together to where the emperor is the one true god uh and the way of bushido is that the way of the warrior but you don't have the samurai you have a national army of 
peasants and merchant children and whatnot. And so you basically have a lot of the old system fall away. It's sort of social structures and social support. But now you have a united Japanese people in a large extent. You have a little bit of an aristocracy that is left over, but most of it's been killed in, you know, era, or I'm sorry, in a continuous era of civil war. And so most of these folks that are alive that are now at the heads, <laughs> I was waiting for it. It's good to see you, Wes. Uh, most of the people that are left at this point is that, um, pardon me, I can't talk. Most of the people left at this point are relatively young. Uh, very few of the old guard are still left in any kind of major sense. So you've got this new aristocracy that is relatively young, that is relatively wealthy, and understands a world that is far more complex than what their forebears understood. And this is largely a capitalistic class. Uh, Japan will largely embrace what we would refer to as state capitalism at this point. Um, and they start economically developing. A lot of it is from foreign investment. You have... Um, Largely what it is is that the Japanese uh, buy into their uh, particular things that they need. They will buy the expertise of foreign dignitaries. And they will, if they need weapons, they will bar it, buy it from the Americans or the British in particular, sometimes the French. But what they are able to do is that they're able to use the technological diffusion of having these weapons and having these dignitaries to the point where Japan can eventually start self-sustaining in building some of these things out and eventually get into particular things like railroads, which Japan will, to some degree, be not necessarily a pioneer of, but will have its own thriving railroad system uh, come the 1900s. And while it is not nearly as complex as what we'll see post-World War II, is that it be you begin to see to a large degree, the modern makings of an industrial and modern Japan. Sorry, double modern. But anyway, you, you kind of get where I'm going here, is that Japan has fundamentally left what has kind of left it dragging in the past behind, and it's embracing newer ideas and newer concepts. Some of these are relatively plausible. If you, you will have a push towards liberalism and a representative democratic state. It won't get that far. What largely happens is that there, there will be a junta form later on. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but lar largely what happens is that you have a lot of reformists within this uh, within this organization that will push Japan in, in significantly different ways that you do not see without within the rest of East Asia. And all of a sudden, Japan starts becoming a major world power. They basically, in the span of about 20 years, will go from technological backwater excuse me on the level of china to contender for world power for you know top eight and uh of course after a series of events this will be cemented number one will be the sino japanese war the first one and this ranges about 18 uh, i'm sorry 1890 1895 I can't remember the exact years, but largely what happens is that Japan basically comes in with new industrialized weapons that they can make themselves or they've bought from the Western Europeans or the Americans. And uh, they're able to just absolutely manhandle the Chinese just the same degree or yeah, to the same degree that uh, all the imperial other or the other imperial powers had. And it put formally establishes Japan, at least in East Asia on the map is now they're the ones in charge, which is a fundamental misstep. Uh, compared to what we've seen throughout most of the history of this region. It's usually either China or some other kind of institution that's kind of taken over China. But now for once, it's actually Japan. This is definitely a, di a different calculus. When you get a little bit later, you have the Russo-Japanese War of 1903 to 1905. That or it's 1905, 1907. Can't remember. Sorry, I'm a little airbrained today. I don't know why, but I'm just, you guys can probably tell I'm a little bit off. Um, just not that it's not been the best day anyway. So what we largely have happen here is that, um, I broke my thing. That's a shame. Anyway, what we largely have happen here is that Japan is, goes to war with the Russians over control of the areas of uh, Northern China and Manchuria. They basically have a geopolitical sphere of influence that is, uh, bumping into it and it leads to, or bumping into each other and it leads to a clash, an outright conflict. What will eventually lead, win or happen is that Japan will win and defeat one of the great world powers. And it actually leaves a tarnished stain on the Russian pride and prestige that will eventually be one of the major factors that leads to World War I, which we've talked about uh, quite a bit before 
Russian history and a few other episodes. We do need to do a World War One episode, though. Um, I'm trying to get to that. Anyway, without further ado, is that um, getting into the meat and the gravy here is that Japan rapidly, within the span of 40 years, goes from technological backwater to world power in its own right. And it is no joke. It, it's Everyone respects the Japanese now that while there's a lot of racist attitudes, so Japan is strong, it's capable, and it's definitely not a secondary power like, say, uh, Spain. It is a power in its own right, and they are now the rulers of East Asia unless somebody really wants to have a fight with them. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of lessons to be learned here that will largely be from the Battle of Tsushima, where you, the all the big gun battleship, uh, as as it's called, becomes the norm instead of having these uh, ships that are bristling with guns and thousands or hundreds of, no, I'm sorry, tens of guns. You just get a couple of guns, but they're huge. Uh, and this is basically where that lesson is learned. Ironically enough, it's not the British who learn it. Uh, but this will largely be what. Um, part of what leads to the commissioning of HMS Dreadnought in 1906. Um, there's a question on whether the British were already going down that route or not, but I don't know. Uh, somewhere between World War I and World War II, Japan invades China and occupies it for a short while. Uh, I'm going to get there because it's kind of yes and no. Anyway, what you will largely happen is, speaking of World War I, is that eventually Japan will get into World War I, but World War I is not really much of an issue for anyone in East Asia, as it's largely the German colonies versus everybody. And so China gets in on it, Japan gets in on it, and everyone gets a little bit uh, of what they want. But Japan doesn't get a lot. They get a lot of the German colonies and are basically without the Asian rim. Um, and they're able to deny Germany its access. Hilar hilarious, considering they'll be allies 20 years later. But in a general sense here, is that Japan just comes in, takes the few areas that they find useful and need, or that they need to expand their influence, and it was just a land grab for most of the powers within Asia. So skipping over that, War One largely goes, or excuse me, War One largely goes over in East Asia pretty quickly, and without some serious major bloodshed. A lot of that's more in the Indo or in the uh, Indian Ocean, and largely in the Atlantic. Uh, there's a little bit that we'll get into the Pacific, but uh, there's pretty much about five books on the subject, and that's it. Um, so feel free to find a documentary if you wish, uh, but there's just unfortunately not a lot here. Moving into the 1920s, you have, you know, um, War One has absolutely crippled the Europeans. The United States is going into the War 20s, and Japan is trying to figure out what, it, what it's going to do. Because for some time here, the British and the Japanese have actually been allies. And this largely starts about 1850. I'm sorry, 1895. Largely right after the uh, Sino-Japanese War is that Japan starts like, cementing itself as a power. And Jap Japan and the British is largely interested in containing the Russians. So, ironically enough, even though the United Kingdom and Russia will be on the same side during World War One to contain Germany... Japan and Britain had been or actually formal allies to contain the Russians. And so while that will largely go over with Tsushima and a few other things is that Japan largely walks out of World War I, a victor, gaining a little bit of traction, but finds itself in a neighborhood that is either, you know, sorry, finds itself in a neighborhood that is either somewhat hostile or openly friendly but has nothing to benefit Japan. And as an example is that the problem with that Japan largely sees here is that uh, the Russians have been defeated. Uh, they could push harder, but that's going up against a major imperial power. And of course, uh, with the communists now in the civil war is that it would be advantageous, but it's going to draw the ire of a lot of the imperial powers of Europe. So maybe um, China is uh, largely trying to put itself together after World War I and is doing pretty well under Sun Yat-sen. Not necessarily something that they want to encourage an era of ja or Chinese nationalism in an era where they're getting stronger and more unified. Uh, because, remind you, invasions actually do have negative consequences. So, oh, how about the rest of the people in the region? Well, that's largely the Americans, which they have a semi-decent relationship with. Uh, a little bit the French, but that's somebody that they were just allied with in World War One, and largely the British. So 
Everyone is a substantial threat or an ally. Ooh, this is not a particularly good neighborhood to be in. So, Japan, instead of throwing the gauntlet down, largely lets everybody ride on the wind of the post-World War I boom or bust and just plays for time. And it doesn't take terribly long before this works. It takes about 10 years. Largely what you'll happen is, is that you'll have the Great Depression, which wrecks the American economy. It hollows out a significant part of the uh, European economy. It, it hurts Britain quite a bit. hurts French, France a little bit. France, excuse me. hurts France a little bit. And uh, Germany is absolutely just neutered by this thing. Uh, and the reason why is that Germany was just a fragile economy that had largely been... Um, punished by the Allies and dealing with them in a certain way so that anything that hurt the Allies was going to hurt Germany, ironically enough. And so Japan finds itself in a way better neighborhood that China is now descended in a civil war between people like Chiang Kai-shek and uh, Mao Zedong. You have the Europeans now basically in screaming recession or depression. And Japan realizes that no one in the region is really that much of their friend. Um, they've been largely able to play one off the other, but it, it was very clear after World War I that the only people that were going to give Japan what it deserved was Japan. And so Japan needs to basically need to form alliances and relationships with uh, powers that are not going to be ancillary to what the Japanese interests are. So that puts the Japanese in immediate shooting range of the Russians, the Chinese, the British, the French, and the Americans. Who could possibly be an ally here? Well, eventually, you'll have a few allies show up. The first one being fascist Italy, which Japan doesn't really see as, as a strong ally. But of course, with National Socialist Germany on their rise in 33, and obviously getting stronger by 36, 37, 38, Japan gets the attention of this power, and they see themselves as common... Um, basically having a common fight. They're absolutely correct. Problem that we'll definitely get into this as we get into World War One is that they will not reinforce each other. Is that, as an example, when the Germans and even the Italians get in, or get in the fight against the Allies, the Japanese do not. And then when the Germans and the Italians get in the fight with the Soviets, the Japanese do not. And then when the Japanese decide to get in the fight, they bring the Americans in. Which is ironically enough that the British, or sorry, the Germans and the Italians side with the Japanese to honor their supposed fact because the United States technically declared war on Japan. Uh, this is called bad strategic thinking. Okay, so anyway, not to send for the axis here, but largely this is just an oops uh, strate in strategic thinking. Is that largely. What happens here, and we're going to rewind back, is that going into the 1930s, the everyone is on, um, everyone is basically either being crippled by the Great Depression or is in no position to deal with the Japanese. And, J and Japan largely starts an expansionist period that is um, absolutely, uh, it's pretty rapid. And, and there's two reasons for this. Number one is that what's going on within Japanese politics is that during the 1910s and 1920s is that there's an era of liberalism where Japan basically has a representative parliament uh, that that we would kind of consider more of a constitutional monarchy and uh, th this is quite a bit of a problem for some of the emperors uh, but also in terms of some of the hardliners of Japan what largely happens is that all this kind of um, boils up to where you have assassinations and all kinds of stuff uh, you know, just bad things that you don't want to see in any kind of representative democracy. And um, uh, I, I will get there, Xerxes. I will get there. Anyway, what largely happens here is that um, political violence gets pretty nasty. The uh, political culture within uh, Japan basically starts falling apart to where it's about to break out into another era of civil strife or maybe even a civil war. Uh, but what happens is that the military largely just steps in and starts forming a junta. Now, this is over the period of about 15 years. Um, and it's kind of a slow agon. But in the same way that it's a bit of a slow slide in, it's largely a, a, a relatively slow slide out. Pardon me, my um, science is just cracked open. Uh, so that hurts a little bit. Okay. Okay. 
So, come 1930, is that the, the Japanese military is largely getting out of control of the leadership, or the political leadership within Japan itself. And literally in 1931, an entire army group, uh, that being the Kuomintang army, literally just walk into Manchuria and invade it and take it over without any orders from the political elite in charge. Uh, and this largely is a, a show of force from the um, from the Imperial Japanese Army that they're in charge. And it eventually leads to a political scandal that leads to a military junta. And this largely is the Japanese military, uh, largely being the Japanese Army, or Imperial Japanese Army, the Imperial Japanese Navy, basically put to get themselves together and that the officer corps becomes the new political elite within Japan. They force most of the reformists out. They form most of the uh, liberals out. And they basically form a hardline military junta. You serve the state. You are part of the military brass. And if you are not, well, you don't really get a say. Um, in some ways, this punishes Japan quite a bit because they, they, they lose a little bit of the uh, intellectual aristocracy that you get with having a more liberal democracy. Um, and that is, they don't have as much uh, R&D that comes out. They don't have as much uh, in the way of the capitalists uh, that w exist within Japan largely helping to ferment a lot of these national industries to sh ensure that they are efficient, well-working organisms. Instead, you have largely a, a nation that gets into some levels of central planning that uh, becomes more that the country is no longer the apparatus with an army, it's an army with the apparatus of a country. Uh, very similar to what we saw with Prussia and the rise of uh, Brandenburg, Prussia, Germany. And that is, um, eventually Japan largely is uh, a self-sustaining military machine that eventually it, it develops itself into. And so, 1931, the, the Kuomintang army invades, um, and I'm trying to say that in the right way because the Kuom or sorry, the Kuomintang is a party within China, and there's the Kuomintang, and I, I I get these mixed up. I apologize. Anyway, the Imperial Japanese Army of of Japan invades into Manchuria. They turn it into a puppet state in 1931, and basically bring it into as a a Chinese province into the empire at large. Uh, obviously, they had already done this to Taiwan and Japan or in Korea, which I don't know if I talked about during the Sino-Japanese War. Sorry about that. Uh, but in a nutshell, is that yeah, eighteen, um, excuse me, eighteen ninety, uh, Korea and Taiwan were pulled into the mix uh, and became well, imperial possessions. Uh, first, co more colonies and then formal imperial possessions. Nineteen thirty one, Manchuria is made a puppet state, and they put the last of the Japan or the Chinese emperors Henry Puyi in charge. But he's openly figures out really quickly he's a figurehead. He's not actually being reinstated. This man had a very terrible life. I feel sorry for him. Anyway, uh, going forward with this is that uh, there's a couple years that goes by and Japan is trying to deal diplomatically with uh, the nations of the world and eventually says, fuck it. They leave the, um, the League of Nations. They decided to go it about themselves. And uh, before long, you have what is the um, Marco Polo, excuse me, you have the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937 where Japan decides that they're going to launch a full and uncommitted invasion or full and absolute committed invasion of China. And they absolutely steamroll the crap out of China. Uh, remind you that China is more or less in a state of civil war at this point. Uh, and while there are disparate factions, they're not all fighting, uh, but they are vying for control in one way or another. China largely puts that aside and unites in full against the Japanese invaders, nationalism. But they can't agree on who's in charge. And so, to a large degree, most of the major Chinese warlords are actually wiped out by the Japanese uh, and are exploited in that regard. Now, Nationalist China is what owns, or the Kuomintang, um, if I'm using that correct, Nationalist Party of China, led by Chiang Kai-shek, controls most of the uh, Chinese core, to a large degree. And, uh, or what we think of as core China, and Japan will occupy the better part of a third to maybe even half of it by the by the inextinable war by the ending extendable war. Now we talked about this in the Chinese episode, so I don't want to reiterate it too much. But largely, Japan is able to permeate into the Chinese triangle. They absolutely dominate the major population centers of China. 
But getting into the hinterlands with the areas that are more uh, rugged, China, I'm sorry, Japan just breaks down. They are able to control the major rail links, but eventually what happens is that their supply lines get so overextended that it's harder for them to push further and further in. Uh, you have a lot of Chinese guerrillas that are blowing up stuff and making it an absolute pain to administrate. And uh, largely what the Japanese have to contend with is that China is simply not industrial developed enough to support a modern occupation. And so the, the Japanese are figuring out that they can exploit coastal China for what everything it's worth, but they can't really push the knockout blow. And so even by 1941, uh, Japan has largely put China on the back burner. Now, obviously, they'll still be launching major military campaigns throughout this, and they'll definitely do this in 1944. But in a nutshell here is that China, uh, eventually Japan says they can't openly beat, but they can openly fend off whatever counterattack that China does. And they're largely more or less right. Um, largely, if China actually pulls off a successful counterattack, Japan will bring in it and launch an operation to counter that, and they will succeed. Uh, there's a bit of a... Um, there's a bit of a wishy-wash that happens during this era, but to a large degree, Japan makes conceded efforts not to overtly push further because they just can't hold it down, uh, while China is simply not able to push back uh, to a large degree. And it takes every bit of um, uh, volunteer units and uh, foreign aid, such as the Flying Tigers and eventually Lin Lease, to really get China to even a comparable fight against Japan. And it's really weird that you, that I have to put it in those terms, but it's not that Ch Japan couldn't push China out nearly as much as that they just didn't have the infrastructure to support it. Um, and so just as a force ratio here is that basically when this all goes to crap and it breaks down is that Japan just can't give the definitive knockout blow to China because China is just not a developed nation in that, in that regard at this time. So let's talk about the other theaters. Let's talk about the other fronts. In 1940, you have the capitulation of France, and French ha France has the Vichy regime take hold. Japan basically demands from the Vichy French, give us into China or we'll take it from you. Uh, so Vichy France just openly gives in no China away. Score one for Japan. Um, largely, this now puts the um, Japanese in targeting line to fighting the allies writ large. Not a bad idea. And had the Japanese jumped into the war, could have went out well uh, for the Axis. The problem here is that getting into this note, you have um, right in the middle of the way between all the possessions that J Japan would like to have, such as Hong Kong, such as Malaya, such as Singapore, and getting into uh, the areas of Borneo and Java that are, are largely owned by the Dutch which have either been capitulated, such as the Dutch government by the Germans, or is on the back foot fighting the Germans and the Italians at this point, and this is largely 1940. Japan would love to get in on this fight, but it can't. One, a lot of its forces are still absolutely involved with, Indo with now invading Indochina and policing it, but also still in China. And so they are stretched a little thin here, not to say... Uh, they cannot bring out forces. They will do so later on in 41 when they do the Asian Blitzkrieg that takes uh, the Philippines and um, Hong Kong and all these areas that we're talking about. But there's a problem. The reason why this isn't done in 1940 is two reasons. Number one, the, the area that's right in the way of all this is the Philippines. And the Philippines is largely an American client state writ large. And Japan is quite concerned that if anyone is controlling the Philippines, that is a existential threat to this growing ja or J Japanese empire. And they don't want to invade Borneo, which has almost everything they need, from rubber to oil to what have you, while in the middle of it, they have this jutting protrusion that is a string of islands that they don't rule. And so Japan basically starts preparing that if they're going to go to the war with the Allies, the Americans are going to have to be involved. Well, at this point, the Americans don't need to be involved because they're supplying most of the things that the Japanese need, particularly oil and steel, to help fuel their war machine. <clears throat> Moving into 1941, though, that rapidly changed. As the FDR administration openly embargoes Japan as part of its, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of its continued invasion of China. 
Uh, they largely protested it since the start, but or the Roosevelt administration largely figures that they should do something about it. And so they actually cut off Japan's major sources of war materials, that being steel and that being oil from the United States. This is a fundamental death blow to the, to the Japanese. And so they largely figure that, one, they need to secure their strategic objectives, which they know exactly what it is, and two, that they're going to be war at war with the Allies plus the Americans. Not necessarily the worst tactical uh, mindset here, but they might have should have just gone without. Um, and of course, that gets even more complicated because in June of 41, as Japan is currently preparing for what will eventually be the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they get news that the Germans, or more of the European Axis as a whole, has invaded the Soviet Union, also another enemy that Japan has. And Japan would love to get in on that fight. But the problem is, they're preparing for the Asian Blitzkrieg that is now less than six months away. So Japan has to figure out, do they prepare for war against the southern uh, the Southern Pacific, which is largely the allies of the Netherlands, which is capitulated, Britain, which is stretched thin, or the United States, that is uh, kind of seen as cowards. Now, a little bit of this is racism, but also is that if you look at American history to this point, we're either fighting second-rate powers, or we're, we're coming into the <clears throat> we're, we're fighting the last battles of major conflicts, such as World War One. And so Japan is quite convinced that if they we, they hit us hard enough. They can knock us out and force us into capitulation or at to some degree they can do such a crippling blow that by the time that we have rearmed and rematerialized to be able to defeat Japan, they could control Hawaii and they can have defense in depth for years to bleed us to death. Uh, and so there's actually numerous different ways that they're thinking of. The other option is Russia. And while Sakhalin may have oil or northern Sakhalin may have oil and whatnot, you know, I'm sorry, I did forget to talk about that. Uh, during the uh, Russo-Japanese War, South Sakhalin was taken by Japan and also the Kiri Islands. Um, and so they did get quite a bit from that. And they also got uh, the uh, port of Port Arthur was formally given uh, to the Japanese uh, sphere of influence. Sorry, missed that one. Anyway, getting back is that the Japanese would love to get in this fight. But the problem is, is that almost everything they need isn't in the north. It isn't conquering, fighting the Russians. It's fighting the Allies. And so, six months pass, and December 7th, 1941, rolls around in Japan. It was declared war on the Allies. Now, unfortunately, this actually isn't a formal declaration of war. This is actually just the surprise attack. Uh, but during the same day, or relatively at the same time, because the problem is that, you know, daylight savings time here, or sorry, excuse me, um, international dateline problem here, is that December 7th in the morning... Hawaii is getting bombed, but that same morning is December 8th in Japan, and they're now launching combat operations not only against the island itself, but will be helping to give the go-ahead for Chinese or Japanese troops to invade Hong Kong, which is right across the uh, right, right across from the Japanese-controlled territory, and uh, preparing for invasions across the entire Indo-Pacific. Eventually, the carriers get home, they, they redisperse their battle groups and their tactical assets, and so you have an invasion of Hong Kong, the Philippines, Malaya, uh, and most of Indonesia, uh, and you're getting into Burma. Um, I'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, they'll largely just come in and they'll be able to take the majority of the Indo-Pacific of Indonesia, uh, the, the British colonies, and they'll get to a point where they're, one, threatening India... And also threatening Australia within six months of uh, committing the actions they start the war. Um, Japan should have hit Hawaii. They did. And, and then attacked Pan the Panama Canal. Well, they were on the way to uh, to actually trying to get to take over Hawaii. Uh, and they were getting to a little place called Midway. And that's where they got formally stopped for the first time. Um, and, of course, second time is largely the Battle of um, the, or the Solomon Islands, which is Guadalcanal and whatnot. You can definitely check out my World War II episode. Two hours and 40 minutes of high-quality content there. But anyway, uh, in a nutshell here is that the Japanese <clears throat> eventually side to do that. They go into the war. You can check out a lot of that in that particular episode. But with sufficient, suffice it to say, the Japanese secure the mass majority of their strategic assets and they're just simply trying to push the envelope forward against the Allies while they have the advantage. Uh, 
They get all the way to bombing Darwin in, in Northern Australia, and they obviously had already launched um, attacks on uh, Pearl Harbor to destroy the American fleet there. And it com comes down to one of the pitch battles of all of the war, and that is the Battle of Midway. By every nook and cranny of this, the Japanese should be pulling this out as a victory. They outnumber the Americans largely 5 to 1 in charge of shipping, and like 2 to 1 in aircraft carriers, like 5 to 1 in battleships. Um, if they even have any battleships at all, technically. Um, talking about the Americans. And, you know, destroyers, support craft, all this stuff. But the Americans actually pull it out. They, they cripple the Japanese carriers during this battle. And uh, the Japanese, or particularly Yamamoto here, is worried that if, the Ameri or if he pushes the attack to invade Midway, is that he is going to have atrocious losses, atrocious losses as the American carrier strike groups are able to just bomb him incessantly, having lost the majority of his air, air and naval uh, carrier aviation. They still have battleships, they still have a lot of these things, but it, this is definitively everyone knows at this point. The era of the battleship is largely over, and the carrier is now the, here to rule the roost. Uh, largely what this will eventually be is that Japan will fo focus its efforts towards the south, towards uh, cutting off Australia from the Americans and maybe being able to invade Australia that way. Um, and so they've been blunted towards going to, or going towards Hawaii, but they still have other options. Comes back down to um, because of the speed and increased range of planes. Uh, not sure what we're talking about there. Uh, with their torpedo launch ability allows them to take out ships. Still don't know where we're at. Oh, okay, we're talking about why, why aircraft carriers are better. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, it, it's more of a... It, uh, it, the reason why aircraft carriers are better is because they can just strike at ridiculous uh, ranges. Uh, if you assume that a carrier does not even move, is that if you have a battleship versus its max engagement range versus a carrier, a carrier with time of flight can engage that battleship three times over before that battleship can get in range of carrier to engage it. That's not a fair fight. And so that that's the reason why carriers become incredibly powerful is that they are such a major power and force projection that while being even more expensive than battleships with all of its uh, mach machinery being the air wing itself and the ship itself is that it largely just force projects power to a degree that battleships cannot compete with it. Um, <clears throat> And so, sorry, I'm going to put that on there. Carrier can attack multiple targets in different directions. That is true, too. Okay, anyway. Uh, going going about with this is uh, the Japanese are largely more or less on the offensive in the southern in the Solomon Islands. And this is obviously Guadalcanal. And uh, it, it rapidly forms into a stalemate. And it will... There's a great thing by Drakenfeld, if you guys ever watch his stuff, where the, the Japanese... Uh, Imperial Navy and the American Navy just trade blow for blow. Um, the Japanese are actually the more competent. They're able to sink most of the heavy cruisers within the American Navy, uh, and they're able to deal just blow after blow. But when it comes to the critical assets, that is like battleships, carriers, and whatnot, the Americans are able to go one for one. And then in particular, what they're able to do is they're, they're able to destroy the, most of the transport fleet that was actually supplying the Japanese forces on Guadalcanal. And so it's really weird. The Japanese more or less get to a point where they're almost in charge of the naval area of the southern, um, uh, of the South Pacific, and particularly the, you know, the, the slot or the uh, Iron Bottom Sound. It's just the area in, in the southern Solomon Islands of Guadalcanal is that the Japanese are almost to the point where they're able to push the Americans out. They've almost got enough of the hardware uh, it's largely just the Enterprise and USS Washington, and that's about it that is are largely left, and there are few escorts. Everything else has largely been sunk, but the Americans during the same time have been able to, you know, at least take keep pace with sinking Karishima and sinking um, another carrier or two. I think it's like two light carriers and one maybe fleet carrier gets sunk during this campaign. But what's really important here is they sunk the transports and the... Japanese actually have to resort to literally loading up their destroyers with supplies and like chaining them uh, in 55 gallon drums and letting them float on the shore. It, it gets to the point where Japan navally is more or less won, but to supply their land forces, they've completely failed. And this becomes the 
reason why this this battle, if you will, or this theater becomes slogged down for the better part of a year. Four months into it, it's largely over. But Japan can't force the issue because with the Americans controlling the land, they have Henderson Field. And so even if the American carrier enterprise now has to back off out of the fight, the Japanese have incessant air power and they can't take back the field. And so they could almost surround them and they actually even shell Henderson Field a couple of times. But largely, they're just not able to push off the Americans because anytime the Americans want to, at this point, is that they're able to coordinate their forces in a, in a way that the Japanese just seem to be not able to do for some damn reason. And they're able to push through another supply train or another uh, another. Um... <laughs> Hold on, I'll deal with that in a second. You get another supply train or whatever that the Americans need to keep this uh, operation going. Uh, and so largely this is a battle of attrition to of to where either Japan is going to be able to bring in new forces and new transports and new everything to make this all work, or the Americans are going to be able to bring in new fleet assets. And for the better part of November of 1942, all the way up until mid-1943, that is a stalemate in this general region because neither can do that. And eventually you will get the Americans to bring in a bunch of their new assets that is the XX carriers and new battleships. And all of a sudden, this battle completely turns on its head so that by the end of 1943, the Americans are absolutely uh, on a tirade uh, that begins the island hopping campaign that goes all the way to Tokyo Bay. Um, so anyway, uh, you should be like, no, nah, we're not starting until we have 30 viewers. Everyone open their alternative accounts. <laughs> I appreciate that. But, you know, sometimes people are here, sometimes they're not. I'm not going to worry about it because I can't stream consistently and I'm not going to, yeah. Uh, that's cheating. Sh sure. Anyway, uh, yeah, come the end of 1943, the Japanese are largely on a defensive. They're trying to reorganize. Re um, and uh, we talk about this during the World War II episode. Again, go check that out. It all culminates into the Battle of the Marianas, and that is the Great Marianas Tuker Shoot, which is the Ameri the Japanese carrier forces are just systematically annihilated. They won't lose their carriers, but they'll lose almost 90% of their carrier aviation and all of their skilled pilots. And at that point, it's pretty much just over for Japan. They just they have to whittle the clock back. Now, a lot of people didn't think that the war was going to go on until 47 or 48. And to a large degree, it looked like that. Because even with the Americans pushing at the gates of Okinawa um, and Iwo Jima in 1945 and closing that out, is that they're preparing for the invasion of Kyushu come, the, come November of 45. But everyone knows that fighting in these tropical islands that are, you know, the size of basically, you know, somebody's testicles versus sovereign homeland islands japan is a complete other um category unto itself and uh, the estimates for operation downfall is that when it is complete there will be at least a million allied casualties two things happen relatively at the same time number one is that the americans have built the atom bomb um <clears throat> anyway uh, yeah, the Americans have built the atom bomb. They decide to use it. Truman orders the dropping on first Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. And uh, the same day that Nagasaki is bombed, which is the second bomb, this is November, or excuse me, August 9th, 1945, the Soviet Union gets in on the war uh, after having defeated Germany uh, 90 days after the war uh, had ended in Germany. And they invade Manchuria and northern China. And so... Basically, while well, Japan can largely hold out for the better part of another year or two, realistically, um, they're largely just forced out because there is no possible way that they can win and get what they want, which is they wanted, in some degree, an honorable peace. And they were willing to fight it out to the bitter end. What uh, the Americans do that is different, and particularly the Allies and the Soviet Union and everybody else, is that they show Japan that that is not going to happen. They will fight and they will bleed. And they will take over every piece of Chinese or Japanese territory until they force um, exactly what they need. And that's exactly what will happen. Um, Japan will surrender within a month of the combination of the Soviet Union's invasion and the atomic bombings. Um, and it's actually up to the emperor to make that decision. Uh, there's a big question on if, if he was forced into it or not. I don't care. 
September 1st, 1945, VJ Day. The Allies declare victory. Um, Japan formally surrenders. You have the signing. And, um, yeah, war's over. Uh, Japanese history largely is, you know, the empire is the sun is set on the Japanese empire. And for the better part of 20 years, it's going to go kind of bad. It's, you know, reoccupation. You've got literally two cities have been nuked. Uh, and most of them have been firebombed and, you know, relatively destroyed. you got to recover from that. It takes quite a bit of time. And also, Japan, while it does get aid from the Americans, not, not, not near, excuse me, it's not necessarily anything rivaling the Marshall Plan that what we'll see, um, uh, what we'll see uh, going on. Um, excuse me, I was looking at that chat. Uh, what we'll see in Europe doesn't really happen in Japan nearly to the same degree. Did you cover the emperor stepping down from power? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was not the emperor. That was Shinzo Abe, prime minister of Japan last year or earlier this year. I think it was earlier this year. Uh, if the emperor stepped down, I don't know much about it. But it, the emperor has largely not been... Oh, after World War II. Uh, no, because he doesn't step down. Um, he's, he's expecting that he's going to get killed, uh, and he's expecting that he's going to have to step down, but MacArthur surprises him and is like, I need you. Uh, you are the face, you are the spirit of Japan, and I need you to, uh, to hold that together. We need to rebuild Japan. And the, the allies basically, um, forgive Hirohito of whatever and all the things that are going on, and he ends up living and ruling Japan until 89. Uh, but, of course, you'll actually get a more modern Japan that is an, electro, or, um, an elected democracy in an American client state. Okay, let's get into the post-war period uh, because this is actually quite a big deal. Largely what Japan had done, and we talked about this more in the country spotlight, is that during the empires that they went out, they took the things that they needed, they brought the, back the raw materials, and they processed them into, into intermediate materials and then finished goods, and they sold them. To the Japanese people that needed it. And so largely it was a more of a military thing. You went and you got your iron ore. You went and you got your oil. You turned it into gasoline and, and steel. You turned it into tanks. And you fed the war machine, right? Um, or more appropriately, aircraft and battleships and shit. What Japan does is they basically say, wait a minute. That, we did that because we needed to. But we're now in charge, or sorry, we're now a part of this greater American super alliance that allows us to buy anything and everything that we could possibly want from anyone who's willing to export it? I got an idea. Let's do what we did during the empire. Let's turn ourselves into an industrial power again. But instead of just making it to where we sell finished goods here at home, we sell it everywhere. We literally become the workshop of the uh, American alliance. And to a large degree, East Asia, that's exactly what Japan does. Is that it largely takes a while to get on board. But kind of 1970, you start seeing some real recovery, some solid growth. And by 1995, Japan is the second biggest economy in the world. It had absolutely, by, by mid the 80s, it had eclipsed the Soviet freaking Union, the superpower uh, of the Soviet Union. It actually became a bigger economy. And it tripped a lot of people up. A lot of people thought that Japan actually might become like a third um, a third axis in the Cold War for a quick second there. But largely what we saw is that it was just Japan being able to participate in an economic system that the Americans had laid out. And while it took quite a while for it to really hit, is that when it was all said and done, Japan played it right. They invested in what they needed to invest into to secure a very stable future under somebody else's aegis. And it led to an era of peace and prosperity that Japan has never seen before. And then the Cold War ends. <laughs> okay, so the 80s, the, the uh, Japan's running high. It's the second biggest economy in the world. And the Soviet Union is going to collapse. And all things are just looking pretty good. Going into the 90s, things aren't looking too bad. Now the Americans have thrown a monkey wrench at uh, a lot of its allies with the plaza accords and that japan cannot be uh screwing with its currency but that's still okay japan's still maintaining a growth pact problem japan had a baby bust just a little bit after world war ii now they would eventually recover from this but 
to a large degree, you have a bunch of old people that are born before the war, some people that aren't born, and then you've got a bunch of people born in more of the 60s. <clears throat> what largely happens here is that in the period of about five years, uh, a, a significant portion of the Japanese labor force goes into mass retirement. And at the same time, there's not as many people to replace them. And you see in 1995, Japan at its economic height, it's absolutely massive. It is basically one, one third or one half of the American economy. And that's no mean feat. And then it goes into recession and it will go in and out of recession, rolling in, in and out, up till this very day, 25 years later. Hello from North Syria. Well, hello, Lourdes. It is an absolute pleasure to have you. We're doing a little bit of a history stream here on Japan, and we're actually getting close to wrapping it up. Uh, we're largely here to the Northern Day, and uh, I'll, I might be able to talk to you in the AMA uh, just after the episode. But anyway, uh, to wrap this all up, Rolling into the 90s, uh, Japan is doesn't have any real major security concerns. Everything's largely going well. Uh, but come 1995, they get in a recession. And this is basically the start of the next setting sun. Uh, Japan is struggling to deal with all of these problems coming ahead of it. Um, they never got in on, on immigration. And while that has secured them domestically to not have a complete intellectual political implosion, is that they are struggling in a world that doesn't have a labor force. Um, and so, yeah, they, they've got a lot of people right now in their upper forties and younger fifties that will be retiring in 15 years. And once that happens, they're, they're completely out of, or up a Creek, but for the moment they are able to figure out what they're doing. And so in a nutshell is that Japan is probably having another setting sun moment, but in its own regard, this is very much a setting to where the sun can rise again. And they can once again prove that they're the land of the rising sun. A smaller, less populated Japan doesn't necessarily hurt. Having more mouths to feed in an area that has to import food and oil and raw materials in a world that can become a lot more vitriolic and a lot more unstable, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we are also talking about a highly educated, highly technologically proficient society that if they really, really wanted to, and I know this is a meme, I fully expect that the Japanese, if they need to take military matters in their own hands, can not only build nuclear weapons, but Terminators and Gundams. This is not out of their, this is not exactly out of their purview. Uh, and if anyone's going to figure it out, it's going to be Japan. I don't think the anime was there for no reason. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, J Japan, at where it's at now, we, we talked about in the, um, excuse me, in the country spotlight. Go check that out if you haven't watched it for some reason, and I hope uh, you have if you're all here. Going into the future of Japan, well, it just could be a lot. I'm, this could be a setting sun, and Japan, I don't think it's actually going to walk away from world history. I don't think they're, I think, I don't think they're going to pull a turkey. Uh, I think Japan might have to lick its wounds for a generation uh, or two, worst case scenario. But there's no one who really can come in and just wipe Japan out as a geopolitical entity. And so even if it takes them two generations to figure this out, Japan's probably coming back sooner or later. It might be sooner. You might see them break out the Terminators and the Gundams and go bonsai. Or it takes them a generation or two to figure out what the new way of operating is, where they have to have a shrinking population and a more proficient population in the use of its resources and what its economic and political structure is going to do. But there's no one who's going to invade the island and kill the Japanese people or destroy them or wipe them off. And so, yeah. Turret tower defense in real life cities. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, it seems part of the Protestant Declaration, the Emperor stayed Emperor, but that was... Um, uh, subject to the L.I. Supreme Commander, yeah. Oh, holy shit, holy shit. Uh, yeah, oh, I'd like an episode on Syria. Um, I don't have that on the list to do, but I can add it to the list. No no promises that's not going to be a thing. Anyway, to wrap up the Japanese episode, the Japanese political history, we just cracked over an hour, but in a general sense here is that history largely has been a bunch of rise and falls. We've seen them just in the last hundred years have more or less two of them. And it looks like they're getting ready to do it again. So, Japan, keep on rocking. We'll see where you go with it. Hopefully it doesn't stain the blood, or hopefully you don't stain history with the bloods of a bunch of people, but yeah. Um, yeah, be interesting. 
Anyway, without further ado, this has been Tiberius D. The stream is not ending. We're just ending the stream. We're ending the recorder. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this particular episode. I do apologize. I'm a little sniffling, a little tired, but hopefully you get the um, you get the message of what I was wanting to talk about. Without further ado, enjoy the outro. <laughs>